Hello, today is June 9th, 2009, and we are in Natick, Massachusetts, and this is part of the Morse Institute Library's Continuing Veterans Oral History Project. My name is Joan Craig, and our cameraman today is Dan McDermott from Natick Pegasus. We are privileged to have with us today Manuel Witt. Welcome, Manny, and thanks for coming. Hi, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Could I ask you when and where you were born? Medford, Massachusetts, in uh, 1925. And did you grow up in Medford? No. I, as, when I was three years old, we moved to uh, Winthrop for a while. And then from there, we moved to Dorchester. And I spent most of my younger years in Dorchester. And did you graduate from Dorchester High? No, I went to Jamaica Plain High School. I took the agricultural course that they were offering there. And, and uh, why did you take that course? Well, I was, I just liked to fool around with gardens. They always had a garden in our yard. And uh, I just wanted to be a farmer, actually. Mm -hmm. And where are you currently residing? In the uh, in, Sherwood Village. In Natick. Yes, ma'am. And your marital status? Widowed. And Widower, I should say. And do you have children? Yes, I do. I have three children, and I have uh, six grandchildren. Where and when did you enter the military? I entered in on. July 14th, 1942, uh, as a matter of fact, my teacher, high school teacher, was a notary public, and I was only 16 years old when he came to my home to try to help me convince my parents that I wanted to go into the service. I was in the third year of high school, and through, after a after period of time talking with them, I guess he did a good job of convincing them, and they said it was all right. So I was 17 years old on July 11th, and then on the 14th, I was at Newport Training Station in Rhode Island. And that was Navy? Navy, correct. Why did you join? at the age of 16 and then go in at the age of 17? Well, I was influenced mostly by my friend Bill, Bill Snyder. Uh, we always talked about it. Then one Sunday morning, he came to my house. I was still in bed, and there he is in full regalia in his Navy uniform standing next to me, and he looked so great. I just, I said to myself, I've, I've got to do this. I want to go in. And it was at that point that I started working on my teacher to please come and help me influence, influence them in letting me go. And why did you choose the Navy? Because he did. I don't know. Because Bill did. Right. Right. Yeah. And at the time, were you very aware of? goings on with regards to the war overseas? Well, I mean, we, I, I, we knew the war was on. I, was, I remember I was at the, uh, Morton, or the yeah, Morton Theater in Dorchester when they announced that uh, the Pearl Harbor had just been bombed. And everybody, you know, this, the, the, the manager who was up on stage, he had stopped the film, the manager on stage, and he said, uh, that means we're probably going to go to war. And it was, everybody got up and was clapping. Everybody it was, everybody was so excited, we're going to war, okay? And being a 16-year-old, 17, mm -hmm. going on 17 at that time, had you heard, for instance, what was happening in Europe? Or was it because specifically of Pearl Harbor? Uh, actually, that, that's my, my first real recollection of it. Uh, we, it was strange. I know my father was always listening to the radio, my mother, and uh, 
but I was more interested in, you know, in sports and things. But uh, it, it was just ironic that I was so non-knowledgeable about really what was going on. Mm -hmm. I'm Jewish, and we, I heard nothing about the atrocities that were being committed there. And uh, at that time, at that particular time, right, we knew nothing about it. Where were you sent for your basic training, Newport? Newport, yeah, Newport Naval Training and Station. And how long were you there for? I was there for three months. What was it like? Well, what can I say? I weighed 111 pounds, and <laughs> most of the, uh, the the other inmates, I should say, <laughs> were all big guys. And I remember when uh, they made me, I was carrying, a, an, on parade I used to carry a flag. And there was one, one gentleman that was a little bit peeved at me for some reason, great big guy. And he would invariably step on my back heel as I, as I was, you know, carrying the flag. Mm -hmm. But I, uh, I made friends with two other men there, both named Manny. Portuguese fellows, and we became very close buddies. And they were big, they were, they were strong guys. And they finally told this guy that if, you know, if he continued to harass me like that, they were, they were gonna take care of him. So, so that stopped that. They were your guards, they were, they were your my, guardians. My guardians, yeah. It was, it was Manny Diaz and Manny Cruz. And did you, do you remember day to day besides the, the parade piece, the training itself, things that you liked or disliked about the? I, dis I disliked getting the shots. I disliked the haircut they gave me. Uh, the, uh, I remember going on the rifle range. I enjoyed that. And the calisthenics were, you know, getting up really early in the morning, get out there. We're, of course, it was summertime, so it wasn't that bad. But uh, I didn't care for that too much. And did you uh, receive any advanced or specialized training beyond what you were learning at basic training? Well, at the uh, from basic training, I was sent to signal school in Urbana, Illinois, University of Illinois, and uh, took up visual communications. And uh, I was there for almost three months. I think we were there, yeah. You know, and it was from there uh, that we were assigned our uh, next duties, and I was assigned to the USS Arkansas battleship. Had you ever been out of state prior to going to Illinois? Out of the states? Mm -hmm. Ah, you know what? I think I might have gone to Rhode Island once. I don't know. I and don't, that was it. So that was it. Was it sort of an adventure for you to go to the Midwest or the Illinois area? Oh sure, I was thrilled. You know, we went by I went by train, and uh, I had a grand time there. Met some nice people, and unfortunately, and excuse me, unfortunately, I uh, took the course, and I I did not become a third class signalman, which was the rank you would get if you had passed all your, if you were good. I came out, I was still seaman for a uh, seaman, apprentice seaman, so that I had, you could you know, would say, I flunked the school. I just could not grasp the flashing light for, you know, and, and the Morse code and the uh, semaphore. Uh, maybe I was too busy having a good time there, I don't know. <laughs> So because you didn't, you were still assigned to a ship. Right. At what capacity? What were you assigned to? I went to? aboard as a regular seaman, a deckhand, but through my own efforts, I managed to make friends up on the signal bridge on the ship, and I finally got to talk to the uh, communication officer and told him that he had gone through three months of signal training and unfortunately, I didn't make the rank, and uh, I still wanted to be a signalman. And uh, after after waiting a couple of days, he contacted me, 
and he said, uh, uh, Manny, it's okay. Well, I'm going to make you a single man striker, meaning like an apprentice. And I was taken out of the division I was in and put into the signal division. So where was the ship? Uh, the ship at that time was in New York Harbor, Brooklyn, the Brooklyn Navy Yard, I think it was, yeah. And uh, I, let's see. I, yeah, well, I, I, yeah, I went aboard. I went from Norfolk, Virginia, from, from the uh, Urbana, Illinois. I was sent to Norfolk, Virginia. Mm -hmm. At that time, the Arkansas was involved in the invasion of Africa. So that I went aboard her in New York after she came back from her first trip to uh, Casablanca. And uh, So was she a fairly new ship? Ship was the oldest battleship in the fleet. Oldest commissioned battleship. in 1911. 12 12 inch cannon on it, which was the smallest caliber of any battleship except for the, uh, the two, another two old, two old ones, the Wyoming and the New York. Uh, we were the only, only ships that had 12 inch cannon. Everybody else started at 14 inch, like the Texas and the Nevada and all those ships. But what was it like the first time you went on your ship? Very good, very good question. I'm glad you asked that. <laughs> I went aboard her in, in the end of December in 1942. Uh, the temperature outside, we came by train from North Fork to New York. We get into an open army truck. And the weather at that point, it was absolutely frigid. It was below, well below zero. And I'm still 111 pounds. And I'm in the back of an open truck with a bunch of other guys. And uh, we proceeded to the Navy Yard. And then I had to carry my sea bag, which weighed maybe close to 100 pounds with the hammock on it and everything strapped to it. And I had to carry that up the gangplank of the ship, which I couldn't do. And on my honor, I dragged it up the gangplank. I couldn't lift it. When I got to the, uh, the compartment, they, they were assigned us. There was a, a port, there was a uh, stair, a stairwell or a ladder, I should say. And I just dropped it down that, and then I followed it down to, uh, I just couldn't handle it. It was too, too heavy, you know. Were you excited, though, about going? I mean, you're just a kid. Well, I had never seen a battleship, and I see this monstrous thing. I never saw a ship that big in my life, although she was, she was only 570-odd feet long, you know, as, as battleships go, where the new ones uh, were over 1,000 feet. But uh, it, was, it was so exciting. I, I just I can't tell you what, what it felt like. I'm in the Navy. Here I am. I finally made it. Now, when you got on the ship, were any of your buddies from basic or from signal school? I was the only one assigned to the Arkansas from that graduating class at Urbana. So once you got on the Arkansas, how long were you in the harbor before you We From there, out? we went out on uh, the first thing we did, we went up to, uh, I believe it was up to Casco Bay, Maine for gunnery practice. That was my first experience. Then we came back to New York, and uh, the, a convoy was forming to go to Casablanca, another convoy. And uh, uh, Admiral uh, Captain Bryant, who was the captain of the ship at that time, uh, who, who made Rear Admiral, was in charge of the convoy. Uh, that maybe they, maybe there were 30 ships in that convoy. It was the Arkansas, and uh, maybe five or six destroyers. And it was one of those those North Atlantic convoys that were in the middle of the winter, and they were vicious. I'm going to tell you, we did we did that. Uh, made two trips to Casablanca, and we came back. And when you say it was vicious, weather-wise? Weather-wise, 
the foul weather gear they issued at that time was, I suppose, in, in ordinary cold weather was adequate. But uh, I can recall on one trip coming back, we were coming at, back to the States, and I was manning the top, the top signal station on the ship, which was a, uh, about a 24-inch searchlight. We were, only, we were allowed to stay up there 15 to 20 minutes, and they would relieve us. That's how bitter cold it was. And we, you know, the ship was, you've probably seen the, the fishing boats that get loaded with ice. Well, that's what this thing was just absolutely coated. There were men working constantly, chipping, chipping ice, chipping away, ice from on the, the ship. away on the ship. Yeah. And that was from the spray of the, the spray water? spray of the water, wow. yeah. It was a vicious winter. But you made two trips at that point to two, Casablanca. Two trips to Casablanca. And doing what? Were you bringing supplies over? Or? We, well, we, we were bringing, yeah, we brought, uh, they were bringing convoys in there with supplies for the troops in Casablanca. Uh, and were they bringing troops over also? The, there were troop transports there too. The, the actual invasion had taken place already. So that the, the invasion uh, of Africa had taken okay. place. And these were just supplemental trips that they were bringing supplies and all. So how long did you do that, going back and forth to Casablanca? We made two trips to Casablanca. We made one trip to Greenwich, Scotland. And I believe it was three trips to Bangor, Northern Ireland. And each time, were you able to get off the ship? On Liberty? Oh, yeah, we could get off. And what was Liberty like? Liberty in Casablanca. Uh, I've got a nice picture of that. I'm going to have to show it to you. I got a good one of that. And okay. uh, it was, you know, it was interesting. We used to get in a, in a, in a uh, horse and carriage, and they would take you around for, you know, to show you different things. And uh, when you did that, were you in uniform? Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You were so young. Were you able to, or did you go to pubs or? Did they treat they, you I, as I don't any think soldiers? That, or? We, we absolutely we had, uh, we went to uh, regular, irregular bars. We could drink. I mean, you know, if you were a sailor, you could drink, you know. Uh, and we would hunt out various places to go, you know, that, you know, well, you that so sailors young, usually do. So <laughs> young and single, mm -hmm. and so did you date at all while you were on R&R &R or? Well, I, not, not, not in, in, in uh, Casablanca. It wasn't a date. You went someplace, mm -hmm. but it wasn't a date, okay? Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> so for a 17, 18 year old, 17 mm -hmm. still, 17 right? 17 still. What, was this considered an adventure? I mean, Casablanca, in this day and age, you think back to, to the movies. Humphrey Bogart, right. That's exactly right. So Let's play it again, Sam. <laughs> was it as intriguing as it played out to be? I, I was in Africa. I'll never forget that the first time the, on, as the ship approached it on the first voyage. Uh, I'll never forget the, there were millions of Portuguese men of war, jellyfish, in, in the harbor as we pulled in. I, I didn't know what, you know, we didn't know what they were but these purple bubbles that were, and then someone said that uh, just don't get near them if you, if you go for a swim. Uh, we, let's see, we went twice to, we went twice to Casablanca, and then on one other trip, we went to Oran, not Iran, Oran in Morocco. Uh, and at that point, we uh, picked up a uh, large group of German prisoners uh, that were to be, we, brought, we were to bring them back to, uh, to, we brought those back to England from there. And did, did you have any, um, were the prisoners completely separate from the crew? No, as a matter of fact, we gave up our compartment. They took over our compartment and we were uh, assigned you know, a lot of other, other, you know, places on the ship to go and sleep. How did you feel about that? Well, I... I didn't want to give up my, my bunk, you know, but uh, this, I have pictures of that in one of the magazines I have. You look at it. Sure. Shows them in there. Uh, they were, the thing that impressed me about the prisoners, they weren't, 
you hear about the Nazi, you know, the Aryan Nazis with the blonde hair and tall. And these, these were <laughs> they're probably mostly Romanians and Bulgarians and, and Greeks and things that had been forced into the army, you know, for, uh, into the German army. Uh, Did so you, were you very, able to converse with any of them? Uh, not really, because the only other language I knew, I knew some Yiddish, I could speak Yiddish, but I, uh, none of those people spoke, children spoke Yiddish. But did, did any of them speak English? Uh, bumming cigarettes, you know, cigarette, uh, cigarette. They knew one, the important word. One smoke, please, one smoke, please. You know. yeah. Yeah. So Thank while you. they were there, were they able to, did they have the freedom to walk around? or were they, they Under God, them? they let them up topside. And they would, you know, get some sunshine and, and uh, a little exercise. And, uh, but they ate in the separate quarters. And, uh, and when you, obviously in, in Africa, um, the weather was a bit different. So how long would you be on duty before you had said you were only on for 15, oh, yeah. 20 okay. minutes well, because over, of the weather? Regular, the regular, uh, uh, when, you were on, when you were on duty, was for... It was usually four hours on and eight hours off, except in if there was general quarters or something like that. But uh, and it was four hour, four hour uh, duty. So this is now 1943, probably. It's a yeah, 43. This isn't 43, correct? Okay. And did um, you run into any unfriendly fire at that time? We in our in the on the convoys. We were constantly being harassed by submarines. Uh, I have no official figure, but I would say that in the uh, four or five convoys we did, I, I, I would surmise that we probably lost eight to ten ships that were sub that were torpedoed. Any close calls with the Arkansas? Uh, our biggest concern once was when the power, when the steering on the ship went out and we were going around in a circle in the middle of the middle of this convoy of ships uh, but we I mean we had uh, I mean we, we, there, there were warnings where they were dropping you know the uh, depth charges around us what was that like for you especially for such a young man I was scared I and, was scared. and, and Again, naively, many watching this might think about what they've seen in a movie. Mm -hmm. If you're on the ship, and was there times when you had to be quiet or? Oh, yeah, absolutely, yeah. I mean, I mean and at, at sea, of course, everything at night was absolutely black. No, no, absolutely no light could be shown at all. Uh, they did have some kind of fluorescent uh, tubing that they had placed along the rails on the ship that I mean couldn't be seen from a distance you know but up close you could see this green like a green neon uh, light so you could guide yourself to, around the ship. So at night with no light mm -hmm. were the ships still moving or were they? Oh absolutely yeah. Convoy. And um, were you at times on duty at night? Absolutely. And being on duty, did you have special equipment? We had we had uh, we had night vision glasses. It was the very beginning of that. As a matter of fact, uh, on on the uh, visual lamps that we sent they sent signals between ships uh, during the day mostly. And at night they finally came up with a filter that they put on the Aldus lamps. They called the the the. Uh, mechanism for sending the message was a filter and the receiving ship had special glasses they could read the Morse code that we were sending. So you were initially a striker. Um, right. Were you still a striker and? Striker and as soon as, as soon as I, I well just to digress for a minute to go back uh, my problem was I couldn't get, get that Morse code by light in my head you know I was a little bit better with flags, semaphore, but as far as with the uh, messages coming, until we held school on the ship, 
this is before we took off on the on these on the first convoy. Uh, no, I'm still excuse me. It had to be the second one, and uh, it set up on on the it set up on the barrel of the 12 inch gun, and from up in the signal bridge, we were hold they'd hold school. I'd have one one sailor next to me who was a, a recorded whatever I told him that I was, you know, uh, receiving from the light, and. Uh, well, anyway, this one particular day at school, they sent the word, and I got the word. It was and, A-N-D. It, it registered. I said, oh, my God, A-N-D. This is a, a, I wasn't stupid, but I was just, I just didn't grasp it. And I got that word, and then I got a couple of words after that, and after that, and after that. And after that, I became very good. I immediately... Uh, Something clicked. Right, right. So now I, at that point, I was, uh, I was third class. I was third class, uh, not a petty officer. I was a, still an apprentice seaman. So I had to make seaman second class, which I did, took a test. Then maybe two or three months after that, I took a test for, uh, that was third class, second class. And I was a second class uh, signalman for about a year. And then I was asked to take the test for, th for first class, which I, I passed. And, and uh, each time you got these promotions, mm -hmm. you got more pay? I think, yeah, there was an increase in pay. And I think, the, my, I think my top pay when I got out was $64 a month. That was my top pay. I was being first class signalman. I may, um, yeah, I know it was, I know it was nowhere near a hundred dollars. I think it was sixty-four dollars. So, uh, once you've done these convoys, did things change? I mean, uh, tell us. Did you keep going back and forth between right. those areas? We went, yeah, we did the ones to Casablanca, and then one to. Uh, I guess we moved from from Casablanca up to North Africa to the uh, Morocco. I see we, when we had Liberty in Oran, and uh, then when we went back, we went back to the States. On the next trip, when we we started doing trips to Northern Ireland, bringing troops to England, uh, starting to mass for the invasion. And did you know what they were mass getting no, together no for? Way. No way. Was there any kind of scuttlebutt about there must be something big happening with all these troops nope. coming and you didn't I know? I can't recall anything. Okay. Any, all, all we know is we were taking troops into England and Ireland. Were you able to talk with any of these or did you just sort of stay in your own? Well, the, the an interesting aspect of one of these trips uh, I have the paperwork I wanted to show you. Uh, I was first class signalman, and we set up a uh, like a, a, a little subsidiary signal station on top of the roof of the Hotel Royal in Bangor, Northern Ireland. There was a gazebo on the roof, and we set up uh, an Aldous lamp so that we could fire, you know, uh, talk to the ships that were anchored in the harbor. There weren't enough berths. Now they, the massing for the, uh, for the invasion, there were so many ships involved that there weren't enough berths or anchorage spots in England. They sent us back over to Bangor to get, to get ready for the invasion. And I ran that signal station. I had two other men with me, one of, my, one of them my very best friend, Harry Steinberg, who I uh, introduced to his wife, and he was uh, uh, an usher at my wedding. And his first daughter was born on July 11th on my birthday. <laughs> it was quite a thing, and I still talk with him. He lives in Winthrop. So you were in a signal area in a gazebo in Northern Ireland. On the roof, right. On the roof, off the ship. Off the ship. So at night, did you go back on the ship? I or? stayed at the, no, there was a, 
uh, USO in Bangor, and we had quarters in there. <clears throat> and how long were you stationed there? It was only about three weeks. And a uh, little side issue, I, I, on, the, on the floor, the top floor of the hotel, just below the roof, there was a uh, communication department, and it was run by the Wrens, like our waves, on the next floor down, okay? And I became very well acquainted with this lovely girl, Jean Gardner. She was an English girl, stationed in Ireland. She wasn't that happy. And uh, I used to date her. And uh, I have a, a, a mass of letters that I still have from her that she used to write to me uh, while, we were, while I was on, on the, during the invasion and, and after that. Uh, lost contact with her, but uh, that was that was great. I, mean, I had my when I had the mid watch, twelve to four in the morning. She would have it sometimes at the same time. So you could, you could be together. We could and, be together. And right. what, could you go out and see sights or? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, we used to go. We went, uh, we went uh, bicycling down to this little town uh, of Dunagadee. I'll never forget it. We had a picnic. Have you ever uh, been back there since? Well, this is the, that's another story. Yeah, back about s seven or eight years ago, uh, my son-in-law, who was as Irish as they can be, uh, his family came from uh, uh, Inner Showen up in the in, in Donegal, and then one day well, we we were we we vacationed. In, uh, in there, we were there about two and a half weeks. And one day we took a trip and we're driving and, and we, <laughs> I see the sign, it says Bangor. And I said, Tom, my God, do you know where, you know where I am, where we are right now? I said, I was stationed in Bangor on the, on the roof of a hotel here. He says, no kidding, Manny, really? Yeah, that's interesting. Well, anyway, he took me yeah, my, Ellen, my daughter Ellen had found some of my papers and she had set it up. We went to this, we went to the hotel. Now this is uh, about 50 odd years after, after, the, uh, after the fact. And I remember I, we went in and I went up to the concierge <laughs> and it was a young Colleen, maybe about 18 years old. And I, I had on my Arkansas hat, and uh, I said, hi, you don't remember me, do you? <laughs> she said, oh, I'm afraid not, sir. I don't really, I can't recall. I said, well, then I told her the story that I had run the signal station on the roof. And, uh, and then I said, would it be possible to get up there to see it? She says, at that particular time, they were working uh, on, the, on the stairwells and the elevators weren't working, something. I couldn't get up there, but we did have a lovely lunch in the in the restaurant, and that's uh, wonderful. I had a, a, that was the well, that was the biggest one of the biggest thrills of my life. Had that it so changed wonderful. much since the hotel is the same. It was built in, in the early 1700s, an old the the Royal. I have a picture of that too, the Royal Hotel, and uh, we, there was the gazebo on it, and it overlooked the harbor. Now it was a beautiful marina there. You know, it had changed, but... And in the harbor when you were there? With capital ships, the Texas, the Nevada, the Arkansas, and, and uh, I don't know, maybe half a dozen cruisers, destroyers, and everything. Uh, from there, we, we, when, we, when the invasion was to start, we all went over toward Plymouth, England, and the... Uh, we were, we were anchored off of Plymouth for a while, went on Liberty in Plymouth, I remember. And then we, we did leave for the invasion from Plymouth, England. And at that point in time, did you know what you were going to? At that point, we knew there was an invasion going. And did they forewarn you what was going to happen? What, what was your role on the, what was the Arkansas's role for this invasion? And you're talking about the invasion of Normandy? That's correct. Okay. Omaha Beach. In Omaha Beach, okay. D-Day. 
uh, we were, one of the things I said I had in my, in my kit out there, well, I, I wanted to show you along with the rifle, there was a knife that they issued to us, uh, like a Bowie knife. And the, the theme was that if, in fact, we got hit, what we would try to do is try to ground ourselves and be broadside to the beach so that we could f continue firing. And if we had to get on the beach, Manny had a knife. And everybody else had a knife. One other little anecdote. Uh, when, we, when we did go, when we got there, and we anchored, they uh, turned off the, all the ovens and everything in the, in the ship. You know, the, and they is, issued K rations to all of us, you know, those black, brown little boxes. <laughs> and along with that, they gave us these cans of Del Monte tomato herring, tomato sardines. Now, when I was a kid growing up in the Depression, we lived on that stuff. They used to be 10 cents a can. And I mean, we, we, my father was where he was. My father was uh, ill. He had, he had contracted the uh, flu during the, after the First World War. And, uh, but anyway, we, we had very little money. And that, that was a staple food in our house. Did he Where'd survive he the flu? He did, yeah. He did survive. He just survived mm -hmm. the flu. Uh, these things, when I saw those, I was the happiest guy <laughs> in the world, I swear to God. Because the food on the ship, you know, was you know, the, the, the dried potatoes and all the, and all the other junk that we had. The, uh, two, now, why, two meals. Why, did they, why did they shut it all down? Because in case we get hit, there'd be okay. only the fires from the ovens. Okay. All right, and, they, and they issued that. Well, anyway, what I did, everybody looked at it, everybody was saying, what are those, you know? And I said, that's tomato herring. They said, herring, what you, you want it? This is the, um, the gospel. I must have collected 96 cans of, that, of, of the tomato herring. So was it a herring in a tomato it's sauce? It's tomato or? It, 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 when I was a kid, there were 10 cents a can. Okay. But, but what was, was it? Tomato it's, based. Yeah, you can buy them still. They still have them in the stores. Okay. They, they're tomatoes. They're, they're uh, cooked and they're in the tomato sauce. Okay. My mother used to mash them, put in chopped onions, and like we have tuna fish today, I would make sandwiches. You know, yeah. a little vinegar on it, and that was a staple, one of the staple foods in the house. So you were kind of oh, in heaven, huh? Yeah, and, and then <laughs> we had made deal. We used to make deals on the ship. Being a signalman, a lot of the sometimes you're in port. And the, uh, some of the guys want to send messages. So we'd do them a favor, especially if you worked in the bakery on the ship or you in, had, were in charge of the spud locker where they kept all the vegetables, you know, potatoes and onions and things like that. And if you were a mess cook, uh, where you used to make the pies. So we used to, uh, we used to barter uh, messages for, you know, for, for gratuities, which was food, okay? So I, when my, so with, with this <laughs> the tomato herring, I'd get, I'd get some onions from the uh, vegetable locker, the guys I knew down there, and I would, I, I, that, was my, that was my main food, that was what I ate. That, and the other thing that was uh, nobody liked on the ship for food was the uh, Baltimore steak, which was beef liver breaded, okay, and then, and then baked. And nobody would eat liver, and I loved liver. I was brought up on, on you know, almost, almost like chitlings. Liver, and so I'd, when I had liver and tomato herring and an onion and some fresh bread, You I felt was in like heaven. you were home. I was in heaven. <laughs> <laughs> oh, um, any close calls during? Close calls. I, when we, the Arkansas was anchored, we were the closest major ship to the beach at Omaha. Uh, I believe the statistics show it was 5,000 5, yards or 4,000 yards. And uh, our target was a, uh, a town called Port E-N, Port, and then E-N Besson, B-E-S-I-N. And uh, the ship had two small airplanes aboard, two OS-2Us that were on a catapult. They used to uh, do that for reconnaissance. 
but the pilots for the invasion were, were the planes were taken off the ship and our pilots were in uh, uh, Spitfires but they were spotting for us for the Arkansas. We were, we were hitting targets eight, ten miles inland. Uh, tank convoys, uh, ammunition dumps, and then we would get back the reports, you know, target demolished, target demolished. This is all, you know, this is... Now when you got the reports back, did you have anything to do with that as a signalman or was this coming... This, this, this came in on, on radio. radio. That came okay. in on radio. So while all that was happening, and if you were on duty, mm -hmm. were you signaling to other ships? Yes, ma'am. That's what we did. We and what would, what would, the sh for instance, in... in something like that where you're hitting a target 10 miles away, so mm -hmm. to say. What might you personally be doing at that time? On that, no, with that, on, when, on the gunnery things like that, uh, I, had not, I had nothing to do with signaling okay. on that thing. We were signaling uh, amongst the ships themselves. They would, they would be, we would get orders to move from one anchorage to another, or to uh, pick up, uh, get, you know, get into position to uh, hit a different type of a target. And uh, that went on until we uh, were sent to uh, Cherbourg. When they took Cherbourg, we were in that fleet that was bombarding them. Now, when you were at Omaha Beach, did you see a lot of lost life? I saw, I saw <coughs> excuse me, I saw LCVPs being blown to heck. And what is that? Is that the small? It was the land and craft landing? personnel, small, the, the, the smaller... Uh, uh, I saw, uh, well, I mean, it, it was, it, it's so difficult to say. I mean, we saw these you know, explosions constantly on the beach from the, from the hills. Uh, we were getting, we were, get, we were getting, getting splashes around us. We were having air raids at night on us. Uh, the, I don't know, in, in my opinion, I think we, well, I shouldn't say, I think we, we made, we erred in one, one aspect. The guns were, when, once the troops started to land, the big guns were of, of no use, coming for, except if you could hit uh, the, the, you know, the, the uh, embankments there. And then the in, if, if shooting way. But they should have bombarded the beaches themselves to make, I mean, they would form foxholes or something, so the guys could hide in. Prior to them. Prior arriving. to the invasion, mm -hmm. although they did, um, they they were bombing it, but they, that was the whole thing was the lack of places for the guys to hide on the beach. To be safer. Yeah, to be safer. That was. Uh, and I, and you you said you were only four or five thousand yards away from the beach. So I could have a you map of that to see you. them falling and see see the young guys falling? Um, you saw well, uh, yeah, I could see because I we had you know because we had, had these the long glasses and all, and I used to watch these things. We, you but, were such a kid. What was that like for you to experience all that? Uh, what what? I, well, I can't say that. Uh, I was <laughs> I was scared, you know, especially when uh, at night there they would they would come out and bomb at night, and at one point there was a thousand pound thousand pound bomb. Missed us uh, like maybe thirty yards. We the ship would get soaking wet from the splash of the shell before it exploded. Uh, were you able to, with your um, peers and your friends, were mm -hmm. you able to talk about it? Did you talk about it? Like that was a close one, or oh hell yeah, was in, in stronger language than that. Exactly. Though, you know? Yeah. Uh, it was. Uh, what can I say? It was. It was scary. But it was uh, exciting, and uh, how long were you stationed outside of Omaha Beach? We, I, I, I had that statistic down. I think we were there for about fourteen days. Moving, you know, we, we did move around. I say we went from our, our initial spot over to Cherbourg. And how far away and was Cherbourg from there? I, I really, I, I have no idea. Okay. But it wasn't that actually that far. And then, of course, we were involved in the. Uh, when they took southern France, Frigis, we went from there through into the Mediterranean, and then and then uh, went back. 
and we went back to England after that, I believe, but it was from Normandy, from Omaha, to southern France. Sure, big southern France. And while you were doing this, did you feel that your um, officers had good leadership qualities? Uh, what can I say? Most of them were, were we used to call 90-day wonders. They went to, uh, you know, they, they, out of the ROTC, a lot of them were uh, just, you know, young, young officers. There was, they were no more uh, efficient than I was or <laughs> anybody, you know. But they had their job to do, and they were officers, and we uh, respected them. Uh, what, what else can I tell you about this? Uh, when you were in the fleet, mm -hmm. what was, was there good naval support for you, uh, good aircraft, air? Oh, yeah, well, the, with, on the in, initial invasion, uh, most of the transports and all carried these barrage balloons on a cable. It was like a, like a small blimp. And these were to, to stop uh, planes from coming in low to strafe. Uh, I, I'm a, a, there, were, oh, there were hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of those on the ships. And we had the minesweepers with us. We had destroyer escorts. We had the cruisers and the battleships. And, and uh, I can just imagine what it felt for those guys in the, in the, in the, in the, in the, in the embankments up there and when, the, when the sun really came up and they saw what was out there. We, as, we got, we got uh, straddled as soon as, the, as soon as it was first light. Now, what does straddled mean? We had, we, there was three splashes from guns uh, around us, and this, we have the picture of that. I've got that picture of the actual thing. Uh, fortunately, we only at one point did we get uh, hit with shrapnel. The ship, uh, the ship didn't get touched at all. We were very fortunate. So no loss of life on your ship, or maybe from accidents? Yeah, the, yeah there was well, the, the accidents. And uh, you know, there is, there is a, one page in there, in memoriam, and it tells what happened. It was something, uh, something with shrapnel. One of, one, of the, one of the guys died from that. But, uh, but then your, your, your experiences weren't over then, because things were winding down in Europe. That's right. And where did you go from there? Boston. You went to Boston. I went to Boston. Got to see family. Boston. The ship pulled into the South Antics in, in uh, Southie. Uh, that had to be exciting for you. And what they did at that point, they, the barrels for the 12-inch cannon, the spare parts, the spare ones, were in storage in the South Annex. They've been there since 1912. <coughs> they pulled the barrels off, off of the Arkansas because of all the bombarding we had done. And they put these other ones, the spares, in there. We were in Boston for well over a month or two. And I was in charge of Liberty for my group. I lived in Dorchester and we were in Boston. Huh? So all my buddies, you know, I, I, I get them I get them off in Liberty. And you tell night. them where they should go to have a little oh, fun. Oh, yeah, yeah. And and, and you was, got some liberty too, I would hope. Of course, yeah, and this is where with, I took my friend, this Harry Steinberg, who was uh, uh, he was second class seaman at that uh, signalman at that time, and I introduced him. We went on a date, and I introduced him to this girl. And where was Harry her. from originally? Harry was from Chicago, and uh, they they fell in love, and eventually married. And as I say, the, their daughter was born on my birthday, first child. That's wonderful. Yeah, it's and nice. I'm to still have, in touch with him. It's nice to have close friends that yeah. far back, isn't right. it? So how, you were in Boston. You said one to two months. Yeah. And while you were in Boston, what, was, what were you hearing about the war at that point? Well, at that point, I mean, there was a lot more information going on. We had heard about the concentration camps and uh, things of that nature. And uh, we knew that <coughs> things were going <coughs> bad in the Pacific. 
and uh, we heard that we would be going over there. Now, when you heard about the concentration camps, at that point in time, did you and your family and your friend Harry talk at all about it because it, the, it was affecting members of your own family? Uh, honest to God, uh, Joan, I, I just can't, I can't recall talking about it. Uh, was uh, there disbelief? At well, that absolutely. Point? I mean, it was, it was it was sounded so. Of course, they didn't have all the uh, the, uh, the picture of what was going on was not that clear. I mean, nobody knew about the uh, the piles of dead bodies and all. You know, that stuff wasn't. But we knew that there were uh, trains going into these, and that the British nobody was bombing the uh, trying to uh, to disrupt the railroads by blowing up the tracks or something to maybe stop these, you know, uh, trains from coming in with all these people. Uh, but, I mean, it, it's probably, it, it's, it's strange that I didn't know more about it. But, but you uh, weren't alone in that. No. A lot no, of I, people I, I, didn't know right, that's about right. it. Did you, with your ship, have anything to do with any of that or liberating any of them? Uh, no, the nothing, nothing to do with that. After, after Normandy uh, and southern France, uh, we went back to Boston. So now you know that things weren't good in the Pacific. Right. What were you hearing about the Pacific? Uh, well, all these, these, uh, the story about Guadalcanal, and uh, you know, the, the places like Tinian and. Uh, Truck Island and all these were all these. And we heard about the death march from Bataan. This 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 was going on at that time. And how did you get your news? Uh, I have some of those. We had little newspapers that were printed on the ship. A little call. Yeah, it was called the Arc Light. Little newspaper. And uh, so. Uh, you're in Boston, you're getting orders to go to the Pacific. Right, we, but we did, prior to going, we did, uh, we did a midshipman cruise in Chesapeake Bay. We were training midshipman officers. Uh, that, was, that, that was about a month or so. And then uh, we went from there Let's see, we did one midi cruise. We were, we were down in Annapolis and in, in Baltimore. And then we came back to Boston, and then from Boston, uh, we left, went through the Panama Canal. What was that like, going through that, the Panama Canal? Do you remember? Thing. I remember. I mean, you know, going through the locks, the, 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 the sides of the ship, you know, one was touching the the sides, and unfortunately we broke down in Gatton Lake, okay? After going through the canal, there's a lake and then the canal continues to the west coast, and the ship, the, uh, something went, went wrong with the boilers, and we were anchored in that Gatton Lake for, uh, oh, I would say about five or six days while they were doing repairs, and uh, we made liberty in uh, Balboa, in the canal zone. So you got to go off ship? Got, got to what, go off ship. What do you the, remember most about that? Uh, the, the pretty ladies, you know. <laughs> what, what did I know? No, we, we did a lot of drinking. And, uh, oh, and now I remember we, we passed, we passed a, a leper colony on an island right, right near us, and we were throwing apples of fruit over to them from the ship. I'll never forget that. You couldn't see them? No, no. We, well, with, my, with the long glass, yeah. we could see people on the beach. They were waving and everything. Uh, and then, so we were trying to, trying to get some food over to them, but it was a leper colony. Ah, from there we went through the canal. We went to uh, uh, Long Beach, California, San Pedro. 
And was that to like restock or? Was, yeah, that was that was for maneuvers. We worked out of there for uh, I don't know, maybe a month or so. Tug so kind of practice and everything. So while you're working out, you're you're pretty. Um, set in your position, but were you doing this also because there were new officers and new middies on board that you were doing this additional training? No, this was just, uh, this was on, on the agenda that we go there and we, and we uh, you know, participate in the, in the maneuvers. These were uh, similar, similar places that, that a lot of like gun for Iwo Jima in those places. You know, so that they were. So they're preparing the troops, they were, you. They were doing the regular landings and everything onto the beach. Practice landings. Yeah, practice landings, and mm -hmm. we were bombarding. And did you know at that time that you were heading for Iwo Jima? No, not, not but at that at time. But that was where that, you were. That was the. That was. Uh, we went. We gathered all the the, the fleet gathered, in the little in the Marshall Islands in the little atoll called Ulithi, U-L-I-T-H-I-A, Ulithia, Ulithi, yeah. And uh, we actually went on Liberty on a little island out there called Mog Mog, M-O-G, M-O-G. And we got, uh, we were given two cans of beer apiece. What was the weather like? It was hot, really hot. Uh, was I, this still considered sort of an adventure for you at this point, or were was, you concerned? No, no. Well, I was. Yeah, we were getting, we were getting concerned because then they, uh, we knew that we were going to go into action somewhere. We didn't know exactly, and till the day they told us we were going to this little place called Iwo Jima. No one ever heard of it. No one, you know, and. Uh, we were, we, we went, we were with the, also the Nevada was with us in the Texas, and uh, <clears throat> the Tennessee, Battleship Tennessee, which was the second ship I was on anyway. Uh, anyway, so over at Iwo. But <coughs> you were still on the Ar Arkansas. Arkansas, still on the right. Arkansas. Yeah. Yeah. We, uh, our target, along with several other of the, of the major ships, was Mount Suribachi. We were actually shooting from the secondary battery, which is our five-inch guns. We were shooting phosphorus shells into caves. That we could actually follow the follow the shell in and, and see what you know, and see the blast and the whole bit. And was it Chinese or Japanese that were in the caves? Japanese. Japanese. Yeah. And could you see whether it was a direct hit or not? Oh yeah, I mean, you you. you uh, well, direct hit. I think that with the equi <laughs> with the equipment on the Arkansas from basically from 1912, if we got within 50 yards of a target, we call it a direct hit, I suppose. You know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> now, while you're doing this, mm -hmm. had others such as the Army come on to oh, the yeah, island the, the, also? Yeah, so you I, were. We had a specific place to shoot at, and then we were uh, gun gun support. They would. Uh, Signal. There were visual signals coming in of of saying that there are uh, a battery on on uh, there's so many degrees, and we had to forward that down to the uh, gunnery department, you know, with to uh, to where to shoot. Uh, we uh, and then it was it was strange because at, at, in the evening, just before dark, a Piper Cub would come out with yellow powder. And fly across the island to, de to my, show you the, the debarkation point of where the enemy were and where we were. They did that every night. And that was an Air Force, a, a, a U.S. Cub. A U.S. Piper Cub, wow. yeah. yeah. That, they would do that. And uh, I, uh, people are going to say, well, yeah, he's full of baloney, but I actually saw the flag go up on Iwo. Really? I had the watch at that time. My group was uh, on watch when, when the flag went up on Iwo. Did you understand the significance no, of it at that no, point? No, 
No, not really, but we just said it. And I reported it to the bridge that there's, you know, they're flying the ensign on the mountain. And uh, then we found out about this Ernie, you know, this great picture that Ernie Pyle took about, you know, the raising the flag and all. But I actually, vis I actually uh, saw that happen. Uh, How long were you at Ewo? We were, we were at Iwo Jima, I think it was about 18 or 19 days. Uh, and was it a constant battle at absolutely. that time? Constant. We were bombarding constantly, and, and the, the B-24 Liberator bombers kept coming over, and they would warn us that there was going to be, you know, it was going to be a, a bombardment so that they wouldn't shoot, uh, anti-aircraft guns wouldn't shoot, you know. Shoot them. Yeah. Well, ex explain what the sounds were like. The what the sound what were the what the sounds were like uh, bombardment flights yeah buzzing noises uh, anything like that you no know, it, it reached the point where I could actually watch I could watch a, a a twelve inch shell come out of the barrel of the gun I could follow it in my eye without blinking to where it landed and we you did we did that much firing. I get used to it. What about your hearing? Well, we had little earplugs we you put did. in. Yeah. Uh, and I used to sleep up on the signal bridge. I slept in a container that we had the big signal flags in. Because I was first class, I, had a, I, I didn't have to sleep down in the hot compartment. I had my mattress in the bottom of the bag called the flag bag. And I, I slept up there. And then at night when they were uh, bombarding, you know, the concussion in that can. I was like in a tin can. Uh, but I, I, I just loved it. I had my, you know, my private quarters. So were you hearing about casualties also, trying to oh, take yeah. them out? Yeah, yeah. Uh, we didn't actually take any care. We took casualties on from Normandy aboard the ship. I have pictures of that also. Uh, I don't think we took any, any of the... Uh, wounded people on at Iwo because there were so many transports out there waiting for them, you know. But uh, we, we, we went up on the side where the actual invasion was. We were on the, on the west side where that, that was our position, firing at, at Suribachi. And other big ships, uh, some were on the east side, some were, in, you know, uh, north. But that was, our, our position was on the, on the west side of, uh, we were there with the, uh, the Nevada and the Texas, the three of us. Um, so you were there for about 18 or 19 days. Mm -hmm. And then as a group, an envoy, did you pull out of there? We, and went, then... back, we went back to Ulithi from there. And... Were you going back there to just get wait for orders? Yep, waiting there. There they, we had yeah we we uh, got resupplied, and uh, we're waiting. The next operation was Okinawa. And did you go continue to stay on the Arkansas at this oh, yeah, point? So you went then to Okinawa. Went and to when Okinawa. was that? Do you remember? When was that? Yeah, that had to be in. Uh, let's see. I got off in September of. Forty-five. It was in September, April, August, August, September. I think August, September of forty, uh, forty-five. August. Somewhere around that point in time, so, yes, of right, forty-five. Yeah. It, and you it were. It was after four. Yeah, it's after. It was in four. Was it forty four or forty five? Oh my. Maybe forty four. Not positive. Um, we'll we'll get back on that. Mm -hmm. So. You were, then scheduled to go to Okinawa. Right. Did you know what you were going to be facing there? We knew it was another island, and it was, 
maybe what, 360 miles from Japan. And uh, as yeah. a convoy going over there, right? Did you face enemy? Enemy? Oh yeah, aircraft? air raids. We had air raids. All the kamikaze. That's when the kamikaze was starting. We were getting. We were so getting, you witnessed that. Oh, I went through the biggest air raid of kamikazes in, that the that they had. That on that one day, there was over 400 planes knocked down. Uh, they, they either were knocked down or, uh, you know, did their thing. The did whole they... fleet was was you know, we were under uh, orders, and we all got to all everybody had to leave the harbor, and we were going up and down the coast. What was that like? Did you feel like this is getting a little too close for comfort, or uh, I, I I I don't know. I guess you get steeled to the. To the, the the thought of it, uh, I ran the a signal station on the main mast. The main mast is the is the is actually the rear mast on the ship. There was this, we had two signal stations. I during that air raid, I was up there. I had uh, five guys with me, you know, and uh, so you're I'm, literally up a mast. Well, up up on the mast and out yeah. in the open, mm -hmm. and we're seeing these planes. We see them coming in. We see them hitting ships. Uh, we see them being blown up in the sky. We see them just missing and falling into the water. Uh, and I mean, there was, you could see, there were, every once in a while you'd see a body float by. It and did was, you kind of get hardened by yeah, that I, too I, after I a really while? Joined, I, I think, yeah, you reach the point where, you know, if you saw a body, we knew that it wasn't one of ours. And would say, oh, yeah, we just said, yeah, it is. Well, we got one. We got one, you know. Uh, the Arkansas ended up with, uh, we had knocked down three, we had three Nazi planes and uh, I don't know how many Japanese we hit. So you hit three Nazi planes in Europe. In Europe, yeah. And... Uh, the, the major things there were the bombardments. There were three bombardments, Normandy, Cherbourg, and Frigis, southern France. F-R-E-J-U-S, Frigis. And then numerous others in the Pacific? In the Pacific, oh, at, 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 uh, at Okinawa, we, we, one of our targets was the capital city, Naha. Uh, we used to just, Sail back and forth along the coast, uh, supporting. You know, we, we would get uh, radio orders of where these uh, gun emplacements were, and uh, we would, you know, get actually get positions where to shoot. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was a continuous going on. We were there for a long time. When you say a long time, oh um, my God, we, off the coast of Okinawa. How long? Are you saying we were weeks off, or months or? Oh, we, well, we were there for well, well over a month. Well over, yeah, well over a month. The, on one occasion, we were going. There were a little group of islands around Okinawa called Kerama Reto. Kerama, yeah, K H E R. Kerama Reto. And uh, they were cleaning, they, they were sort of cleaning up on that, uh, on those islands at the same time. We were going over there. We had two escorts, two destroyers. Both of them got hit by kamikaze. Didn't sink, but they were hit by kamikaze. So did that make you feel that you were a little... A little bit scared. A little, a little scared, little yeah. Covered, like, like, less like, covered. Like, it's a good thing I had my trousers on, you know. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it was, that was, that was really scary. And, uh, I don't know. Uh, so after Okinawa. Okinawa, in September of 45, September, October, November, December, yeah, in September, Around the September 23rd, I believe it was, uh, the uh, 
uh, war was over. Okay, war ended. And you're still in the Pacific. We're still in the Pacific. We're still at Okinawa. Uh, we went. We went to uh, Guam from there. We went to dry dock for repairs. There was things that had to be done. Then we went back out, back to Okinawa, to Buckner Bay. And the USS Tennessee was in the anchor near us. We were in their division. The, uh, they were the commander of battleship squadron one, Jesse Oldendorf, rear ad, a, a vice admiral, Jesse Oldendorf, uh, came aboard the ship to, for, to give us an inspection. And now this is the Tennessee that you're on I'm, now. No, I'm on the Arkansas still. Okay, all right, sorry. They did the uh, did a, they did an inspection. We're all at quarters, you know, and uh, after the after the uh, that we the I got the word that I was going to be joining Admiral Ollendorf's staff as a flag signal man. So that's kind of an honor, that's, correct? Yeah, Admiral Staff, right. Uh, and the Arkansas was getting ready to go back to Seattle for Navy Day. War was over. And they became part of that group that was carrying troops back to the States. And I got Shanghai <laughs> off of the ship, right at, right at anchor. Yeah, you walked down the you know the ladder along the, along the ship, in a small boat with my gear, went aboard the uh, Tennessee, and waved goodbye to the Arkansas. So prior to that, when the vice admiral was coming to inspect the ship, were you all in dress, what you would consider dress uniform, or? Uh, at, at that inspection, we were wearing blues. We didn't. It wasn't the. Yeah, we were wearing. As a matter of fact, yeah, we were, I got, I, I've got the picture and I may be wrong. And I might say to those who will be watching this that mm -hmm. eventually these pictures will be on our website. Yeah, absolutely. Which is www.natikvets.org under your name. Right. It will take a while to get them up and running, right. but they will be there. So yeah. I apologize for the is interruption. This, uh, okay. Uh, anyway, I go aboard the Arkans, uh, the uh, Tennessee, and... Uh, we're heading, uh, Admiral Oldendorf is in charge of the occupation of southern Japan, southern Honshu. Uh, and what, what we actually did, we went into, the first place we went into was uh, Wakayama, the naval base. And that was the, that was the port where the, the midget Jap submarines were made and where they stored them. I have. I went inside of a midget sub, and I ripped off a schematic, half of a plate, of an aluminum plate. You're showing the schematics of the wiring and, and the thing. And while I was in there, God, gospel, a marine looks down the, the the hatch of the thing with a machine gun, and he says, "Get your." But out of there, he says. Don't you know these things are mine? He says the the whole place was. So anyway, but I took this thing with me. Now, just jumping back a bit, okay. as you mentioned, the war was over because of the dropping of the bomb. Absolutely. And had you heard about that? Nope, not until it happened. Okay. And yeah. once you heard about it happening, mm -hmm. what was the sense on the ship? What was the sense on the ship? Yeah, was there With a the, sense of relief? Well, the sense of relief was that we knew that we wouldn't, the way they, they uh, presented it, we would not have to invade the mainland of Japan, which would save, you know, probably maybe a million men, who knows, you know? So we were thrilled about that. And uh, personally, driving through on the back of a truck in Hiroshima, so I tell us happened. about that. So yeah. you you were on the ship on the Tennessee now with Oldendorf, and as you said, he was in charge of the mm, occupation. Right. So he had to make sure that everything 
what was his charge? I mean, the occupation meaning taking would, over right. from As the Japanese. Right. As a matter of fact, when we were at when we were at Wakayama, Marines and Army troops were coming ashore in landing craft. We were there already. Okay. Okay. Yeah. As a matter of fact, we had made liberty already. You've been in a line in the Geisha House. You've <laughs> 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 been in a line for four blocks long. <laughs> Going to a Geisha House. That's great. Oh God. Uh, right, and, and uh, now the, at that point we I get transferred off of the uh, Tennessee onto the Appalachian, USS Appalachian, communication ship. Wherever the, wherever the Admiral went, that would become the flagship. So it was, we were not only on that, at one point I was on the Springfield, Cruiser Springfield. But for a short period of time. Short period of time, on the uh, and then on the Appalachian. Uh, so for a young guy who supposedly flunked the initial mm -hmm. signal school, right. you must have had a really good reputation to I, be. They used to call me Steady Dash Wit. <laughs> steady Dash Wit. When you get a signal on the, from the Aldous lamps, after every word you give a flash meaning that you received that word. Man is recording it next to you. When they, at this point, I would, when someone was calling us, I'd press the light and keep the light on steady. Go as fast as you want. I'll get the message. So that's called steady dash. I was steady dash wit. So you came a long way I from did, yeah, signal yeah. school, didn't you? And I had an opportunity to sign over for six months. I would have been a chief signalman. But I, I refused it. I didn't, I okay, to get before it. we get to that, yeah. tell us about seeing parts of Japan after All right. the war. Uh, Admiral Ohlendorf's main task was going into these different ports, uh, like I, I remember some of them Kyoto, Kobe, Kuri, Sasebo. Uh, and actually, the commandants or the heads of that uh, county or that division where, where the town was, they would officially they would come aboard the ship, and just like with the, uh, General MacArthur, where they just came aboard and they signed the truce, they would come aboard, and they would actually uh, surrender formally and pass the sword. But Jesse would not touch the swords. He didn't want nothing to do with them. His aide, he'd say, you know, take the sword. He didn't want it. He was about 6'4", big guy. And, you know, these uh, officials from, they're not known to be giant people. So that, and he, he didn't tolerate them. Now, were these officials in uniform or were they from some, the, were, some of them were in uniform, some of them were in tuxedos. You know, they actually come aboard and officially Surrender, and that was we, we we did that in perhaps I would say uh, easy ten or eleven ports. And then you uh, you were able to, as you mentioned, take a trip to see the after effects in areas of Japan. I want well, yeah, well, I drove through here. The I mean that's the main one. I drove right through Hiroshima. Right Tell. through the center of town, uh, the most amazing sight. I mean, it never, never, you can never, you never get it out of your mind. On the outskirts of the of the uh, metropolis, little little farmhouses and, and and shacks and things, they were just blown over, just lying, just like collapsed. And as you got closer to the center of town, that's when you started to see a lot of rubble. Then. In the center of town, there's a river. That river was dry. It had evaporated. Uh, my one view I'll never forget, the sidewalk and a barber's chair bolted to the sidewalk and nothing around it, not even rubble. Uh, superstructures of big, of, of uh, you know, tall building, would call them skyscrapers, where the uh, metal 
the metal framing of it just lying down like straws, just lying there, and the rubble, you know, some rubble, but mostly just, just nothing. Uh, at, at this point, were there smells or heat or? You no, know, it, 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 really, it didn't really smell. I mean, the, you know, this was about a month after the bomb. Uh, they not good. I, I never, you know, get no radiation. I, I don't think today they would go in there like that, you know? Open truck. Now, going through these areas, were civilians trying to s pick up the pieces, so to speak? Yeah, or? You, put, they, they, you know, there were people walking around. And were and they, how did they react the, to the looks seeing they, you? The looks, the looks they gave you were, uh, you know, enough to kill you, you know, the way they would look at you. Here comes the conquering heroes are coming in. You just killed, what, 100,000 people, you know? Uh, Did you see any injured? I any saw people. Oh, I saw you know. I saw people with you know with, with big red marks on their face and all. And uh, but as far as just I mean, lying dead or anything, I didn't see any of that. That had been cleaned up. And what were they setting up tents or huts or how were they uh, surviving? Joan, I don't. I don't recall seeing any yeah. huts or tents. We were just too busy looking at at the, at, at the damage, you know. And again, you're a young guy. Mm -hmm. You've just experienced months mm -hmm. of combat. Right. And you go into a town like this, and you mentioned earlier the conquering hero. Did right. you feel like a conquering hero? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Yep. You know, at that point, you're thinking that this could have happened to us, you know. You know, uh, it was just, it was, it was terrible. But memorable, you know, and uh, just hope to God it never happens again. And so how long were you in Japan? I was in Japan for the, the up until, uh, up until December of 45. I uh, went there October, November, December, like three, just about like three months. And still on the Tennessee. And, yeah. And did but you? We had gone to Nagasaki also. I didn't get off the ship because I had had my appendix out. Yeah, talk about that. How did that all occur? You had it we out on the ship. On the ship, I, yeah. I had I had it on the ship. I, I had a stomach. I had always been bothered with with stomach aches, and uh, I had a real bad stomach ache. And I went down to the sick bay, and uh, the pharmacist mates as well. I had a temperature, and you know, he pressed my stomach, and he, he says, that's right? I said, yeah. Then they got the doctor down. I can't recall the doctor's name, but he had been a uh, plastic surgeon type of a doctor in Hollywood for, uh, for, the, for the, you know, the actors and actresses. My appendix guy was only about that big. <laughs> <laughs> he did a beautiful job on me. And I had my disability for being, having to be, you know, having a, be, be able to use the VA, you know. Because no you cost. had to have surgery. Be, be had to, so that if anything ever happens to my appendix guy, then I, maybe I could get some compensation. I have a zero disability, and it's for the scar. If, it ever, if anything ever happens to it. So you didn't go to Nagasaki. How was the medical care on the ship? Oh, the medical care, the, the, the medical care was great. I mean, uh, you know, having gone through a long period of uh, dysentery on the Arkansas when we were in, uh, in Guam, as I recall. Did uh, it go through the ship? The whole ship, yeah, everybody was sick. It was, you know, because we, we had very, uh, for an old ship, uh, the, the equipment aboard, the evaporators for manufacturing fresh water were ancient, and we were always... Uh, lacking fresh water on the ship. We go to take a shower. We'd go down to the head. There'd be a marine. We had marines aboard, and you'd have a bucket that you owned. He came there. He'd open a spigot, give you a half a bucket of water. You'd go over to a pipe. It was a steam pipe. Open it up. The steam would make the water hot. Give it to you. You had a, that was your. You took a marine bath. That's what we called it. And I it wasn't even shaving then. When I, when I went aboard. Uh, 
because you didn't to, have to. I used to, I, I'd be in the next sink from so I had a razor, bla a razor without a blade in it, honest to God. I used to lather my face to make, to make believe I was shaving. <laughs> I, and, and to this day I don't shave only once in three days. So. That's great. <laughs> oh well. So did you come back to the States on the Tennessee? No, I was, uh, I went to, we went to, I went to Tokyo, and uh, at Tokyo, I went to, uh, I was, I went to walk uh, to Yokohama, and from Yokohama, uh, I was discharged off the ship, and I went back on the, uh, uh, to transport the USS Hendry, H-E-N-D-R-E-Y, Hendry. And that went right back, right to uh, San Diego. San Diego by train to the Fargo building in Boston, right under the backyard. And at this point, were you getting discharged? Getting discharged, I got discharged in Boston. Um, and when, do you remember the yeah, day? Yeah, that was January 29th, uh, excuse me, December 29th, of 45. What a December way to bring in the new year in your yeah. own home state right. Right. and all together except for a little appendix scar. All for an appendix scar. Wow. At what rank? Signalman first class. If I had taken, if I had shipped over for six months, I had the opportunity, I get the paperwork on that, I would have been chief. Uh, I would have been chief. Of the, it would be a uh, with a T after would be temporary, but I would have been a chief signalman. What was it like for you feeling, what were your feelings like coming home? Well, coming home, I, I had girlfriends back home. I was dying to get home. And I noticed the plural on that, <laughs> girlfriends. That's a fact, right, right. Two of them, they, both of them lived on the same street where we lived. I can not sure I mention their names, no. <laughs> it's up to you. Phyllis and Selma. Phyllis and Selma. My two girlfriends. <laughs> but you didn't marry Phyllis or Selma, did no, you? No, no, no. When you came home, um, did you discuss with your family or friends what you had seen or done in the service? Uh, well, I, one thing where you might interject, my sister was a wave. She was. Right. And where was she San stationed? San Diego, San Diego. So when you pulled in, when we did pulled you in see her? to San Diego, I sent a signal over to the tower at North Island, where she was at the air base, and we made liberty together. She and her girlfriend. We went to Tijuana. Uh, it was she younger or older than you? She was old. She's a, she's nineteen months older than I was. My brother Chick was in the Merchant Marine at the time, and I saw him uh, in, in, I saw his ship in Casablanca, I couldn't get to it, but he was, all, he was on a, uh, a tanker, and he was at Casablanca the same time I was on one of the trips. And did he make it home safely? He was torpedoed twice on two different ships, he was in a lifeboat for three days. Uh, when he came home, he brought back a little dog with him they could only understand Spanish. <laughs> <laughs> and then, so that, my eldest brother, uh, he, was 4F, he, was, he was 4F, he was 4F. He was the only one, but Helen was in, myself, my brother Chick, and, uh, and my, my other brother was in the city hospital at that time. He was suffering with Lou Gehrig's disease. Oh, wow. I have about 25 letters that I had written to him, and uh, he saved them all, and I have them back now, where it's got you know censored, were cut by, and, and all that different stuff. things they didn't yeah. want you to. Right. Was but, he pretty young getting that? Yeah, Lou died at 38, after being sick for 12 years. So d did you or didn't you talk with Chick or with your sister about? what you had seen. Oh yeah, of course, yeah, we, we discussed it. Uh, although Chick, he didn't, he didn't want to talk about that torpedoes jobs that he was, that had happened. He didn't, didn't want to do too much talking. 
But I, you know, sometimes I would not brag, but, you know, I would relate my stories. I wasn't nothing to be ashamed of or anything, you know. Did you join any units of the military reserve? Uh, no, like the Arkansas had a, uh, a, a, a organization. I, I went to five of their reunions, and uh, they just stopped two years ago. Because, oh, 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 okay, well, let me finish. Okay, they stopped two years ago because there weren't enough guys left mm -hmm. from the signal gang, you know, and, and then for the rest of the ship. And uh, what was I, oh, I was going to say something very important and I forgot. See that? Think now about it. Did you join any veterans organizations? No, I never did. Did you use your GI Bill? Yes, I did. And did you go back to school? I went back to school. I got my, I got my high school diploma, but I, I got a, uh, an allotment for doing that. I, had gotten, I, I got a war diploma. I have mm -hmm. three diplomas from the, from, I got one a war diploma from Jamaica Plain High. I got one uh, after the war. I went to they, for one year to English High. And then on my 80th birthday, my children didn't know I had diplomas, so they went to the city of Boston. And I have another one from Mayor Menino telling me that I'm a graduate. You know that I honored. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and you've used their insurance or medical? Oh yeah, I have GI insurance, and I use I've used the medical. What did you do after the war? What over the years? Oh my goodness, what did I do? Well, I married. I was I got married at twenty two. A girl from Boston. A girl from Brighton, yeah, Dot from so well actually from Dorchester at that time. Yeah, she lived in Dorchester, and. Uh, her father and brothers had, uh, they were in the donut business. Do you remember the Shoppers World, uh, the donut shop and Shoppers World back in the 50s, maybe? Do you? TikTok donut shop? Yes, I do remember. That was, that was our place. Yeah. So did you work that? I was manager there for, uh, for, uh, from 1953 to 59. So you've probably seen a lot of change in this area, haven't oh. you? Absolutely, absolutely. After that, I, uh, when, they, when they closed Shoppers World, the donut shop, because tick the uh, uh, Duncan had opened up down the street, and uh, I took over Giovanni's shack, the on hamburger place on Route 9. I ran that for three years. That was, uh, that was my place. Great place. I had my nephews worked for me there and everything. I had a grand time, yeah. Yeah, I've been in, in Framingham since 53. How important to you was serving in the military? On a scale of one to 10, nine plus. It was, it was the most wonderful thing that ever happened to me, I think. Why? I made, I made, I made friends I mean, to, that I have to this day Still stay in, stay in touch with them. Uh, just just last year, no, two years ago, uh, a very close friend, Joe Palacastro, died. He lived in uh, Stanford, Connecticut. We were like uh, Harry Steinberg, who was I introduced to his wife, and Joe Palacastro and Manny Witt. We were a trio. We uh, used to get together uh, many occasions. Aside from going to the reunions, we stayed very close. Were you almost like brothers? Yeah, I would say so. Looking back on it all, do you have any either memorable experiences, a character, or a, a humorous experience that you'd like to share with us? Well, that humorous one was the one about the tomato herring. I love that, about the day ra rations, <laughs> the, the, right? The day, yeah. the, the yeah. rations, right. That was, <laughs> that was the... Uh, Greatest, greatest thing. Uh, what can I say? You know, the the feeling in the in the Armada going from uh, from England to Normandy, and with those the ships with those blimps hanging off of them, and with the minesweepers going off, and the anticipation watching 
when we got, just before we anchored, before it got light, watching dog fights, you know, you hear about these things. Can't see the airplanes, but you can see the traces going back, and then once in a while you'd see a splash, you know, a, 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 an explosion. Uh, mem memories like that, I mean, that they're, they're embedded in there like uh, cement. And uh, I'm still a little sort of corny about it. I like to wear my Arkansas cap, you know. And, but that's uh, yeah. pride, don't pride, you think? Right. And then uh, I had the great pleasure, of friend, a very good friend of mine, uh, who was very active in the Navy League. Uh, we, we went, he arranged a trip. We were in Norfolk, Virginia. We flew out to the aircraft carrier. With, this was with my wife and his wife. We flew out to the aircraft carrier Theodore Roosevelt and landed on the ship. So we were at sea, about 130 miles at sea, on active, re you know, uh, not on uh, regular maneuvers, doing the daily thing. We uh, we had dinner with the admiral and the captain and the officers that first night. Uh, second day, we had uh, breakfast with the chiefs in the chiefs compartment, and then we lunch with the with the crew, on, on, the, on the regular crew. And we watched maybe 150 landings and takeoffs off of the ship. And Quite different than oh, was, from the Arkansas, the, right? The, 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 uh, the Theodore Roosevelt was, I think it was 1,100 feet long. And it has something like 14 decks. I mean, it's, t it's just as tall as uh, like the big buildings in Boston. And uh, but the crew was so good, they, they took us around, they explained everything to us, you know. And they, they were about 400 women waves aboard that ship. Again, a little different yeah, than... Yeah. And then when we left the following day, catapulted off the ship. You know, you hear about it. God love my wife, Norma. She developed an ear problem from it. They, we, we revved up when they, till, they, till they build the steam up in the catapult. You know, for, it takes about five, six minutes. And uh, then when that thing let go, oh, in, in three seconds you're doing 150 miles an hour. What, what a thrill that was. You know, that was sort of, let's see. But I've had some great reunions on that ship, old buddies. And uh, that's some. Navy was good to me. As we finish up with this wonderful interview, are there any thoughts, comments, or any additional things that we haven't covered, or something that you would like to leave with not only your family who will be seeing this, but also those in the future who will be seeing this through the library and through Natick Pegasus? What can I say? You, you know, you, you say you, you, your dad was a was a sailor. He was. Uh, it was a good sailor. I got a. I got the. You know, a, a honorable discharge. I got commendations from the French government. I have a diploma for for uh, the participation at Normandy and in southern France. Uh, and to be able to live to live through all that and then come end up with the. Great family I have today, the most wonderful children in the, in the world. My wife's been gone uh, three, two years, December. And uh, anyway, Daddy loves you. What can I say? Well, Manuel, we, we want to thank you for your service and for this great interview. Oh, thank you so much. It's been a so great much. pleasure. Now I'm going to cry. That's okay. Okay? Okay. All right, all right.